Hey people, because in the past it was well received, here is another question and answer video. If you missed that you could uh, send me your questions, please check and subscribe to my other social media channels on Facebook and Instagram because every once in a while I do things like this or current news um, you will get on there. And I try to answer all your questions, even the very specific ones, because maybe they are interesting to other people as well, the answers, that is. But um, the best thing to help you is always a personal lesson. I try to give you uh, general advice and robust tips, but it's the best investment if you take just one hour and we look at the problem together, maybe on Skype or if you can take the time and travel to Northern Germany, let me know, I'll be happy to help you. So let's start with the first question. And the first question is, broccoli or cauliflower? I mean, why or? Why not and? I mean, they're both, I mean, it depends on, I mean, please don't make me choose. And the next question is, can you do a video about double or triple strokes or generally uh, foot technique on the drum set? Yes, uh, I will do videos about that topic, but be patient because um, I have a lot of videos scheduled for the next months and years actually. And um, a part of that is a video series on foot technique, uh, but please be patient. There will be uh, a few videos before that. And if you can't wait, there are other great videos. The first one is, of course, Secret Weapons for the Modern Drama, Volume 2 by Jojo Mayer. Question number three, have you played live with a click, uh, for example, with the band Ohrenfeind, and what's generally your experience with playing with a click? Yes, I have been playing uh, live with a metronome, but not too many times and not with Ohrenfeind, because here uh, we thought it more important um, to have this lively um, interaction, this real interaction between the musicians. But uh, what's very important is to use the metronome in rehearsals and preparation for gigs or uh, studio recordings, because sometimes songs work in a specific tempo very well. Some songs have a bigger margin of error, so you have like a window of 20 to 30 beats per minute where the song still sounds good if, if everybody plays together and actually uh, respects the tempo and tries to let the song sound best in that tempo. Because sometimes you have this phenomenon when you count in and somebody else, uh, it's, it's ju just not the, the comfort tempo for some person and he or she speeds up or slows it down. This brings me to the next point. It's very important to actually clarify who is in charge of the tempo. Because if you play with a click as a drummer, of course, everybody has to follow you. But the downside of that is that you have few less um, yeah, capacities for uh, musical interaction because a part of your cognitive power is just reserved for staying on the click. So you have just a tiny bit less cognitive power to focus on uh, the musical interaction and stuff like that. So it really, as always, depends on the situation. If you have backing tracks, of course you need a click. If the band leader wants you to play with a click because the tempo has a high priority, um, that of course is important and then you should do it. But I usually use the click for practicing to, to practice my own timing so I don't need a click. So, of course, I don't have uh, perfect timing, but uh, my timing has become much better, so we don't actually need to play live with a click. And um, what's a very good investment is to, um, yeah, just put it on the table, the, the, the topic of timing and what tempo um, the songs should be, and then practice at a rehearsal with a click and change the tempo and see how the song sounds. And also a very, very good investment is to, together with your band, analyze a live recording and then also check the tempo and maybe um, talk about uh, if you should play it faster or slower. And then you can use the click just for the uh, counting in. If the singer maybe um, says a few words before the song, you have the time to check your click and you get used to the tempo and then you count in at that tempo. But then you play together without a click, so you have the real musical interaction. 
Next question. I can only play linear fills, but I would like to play more creative fills and more creative beats. I can only play boring basics. What's boring about basics? The most important thing, it will get you the furthest. A good groove, a good um, simple but musical fill in on a well-tuned drum set. The best you can play in most cases. But of course, if you want to play, play more creatively, please do that. But be careful because creative fields, creative groove, that means something different for everyone. I, I have no idea what you mean with more creative fields. But generally I would say just keep on learning, keep on practicing. The more experience you have, the more you will be creative. And also if you know what you like, if you see or hear something that you would like to play, analyze it. Go deep and try to find out what are the necessary basic skills to play like that. Not to play that one fill in, but to play like that and practice that. And of course there are some books or videos about that. I have two videos on more creative grooves and two um, creative fills as well. Next question. Can you make a video on ghost notes? Yes, actually um, I have a video on that topic in mind already. I will do something about it. But if you already know what you are interested in, what you want to learn, then just again, go out and do it. You don't need me. Of course, I'm, I'm uh, flattered that you uh, ask me this question. But if you want to learn something about ghost notes and it's a vast field, I don't know what specifically you want to learn, what application you want uh, ghost notes to learn for. So just go out and do what you want to learn. There are videos and books and, and other uh, things about this topic. So just do it. And again, uh, I can help you the most if you just get in touch with me and we'll maybe make an online lesson. How relevant are the up and down strokes in rock and pop music? In the beginning it was impossible for me and I couldn't do the movement uh, and now I'm only doing the up and down strokes but I'm not allowed to do this in my lessons. I don't actually understand why you're not allowed to do that. If you if you can play the technique, then please use it. I'm, I'm sure that your teacher thought of something and maybe has a plan in mind, but if you're able to do it and if you know what to avoid, then why not use it? Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the up and down stroke is a very simple technique, a very common technique where you uh, play it of course a downstroke and then use the upward motion to make a secondary uh, but softer note uh, that is not by design but just naturally it has to be softer if you do this movement and um, you can play very fast because you have two notes for every downstroke but of course you always have this accent. It's commonly used in uh, faster music, of course, so uh, played on the hi-hat or the right cymbal and very, very much in pop rock and metal and other styles. And so, yes, it's very relevant, but be careful. You also have to be able to uh, not play this because sometimes um, you don't want the accent. You want just soft, uh, even notes on the hi-hat or the right cymbal or you want uh, to accent all the notes. So uh, yes, it's very relevant. You should be able to use this technique, but you should also be able to not play this technique. <laughs> because usually when we have a new technique, we play it everywhere. Uh, in German, there's this phrase, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you should use the technique when it's appropriate. Here's a question I've heard before and actually answered before, but it's so important and I hear it so much that I just answer it again. Um, I'm a little frustrated with my left, my weaker hand. Um, I'm just not as good uh, with the techniques with my left hand. Are there any specific exercises to train the weaker hand and how can I um, get over my frustration in practicing? If, if you're frustrated, you maybe uh, have set your goals a bit too high. I know this idea, many of my students and I myself have had this idea of just picking a very difficult exercise, or a very difficult song and just practice, practice, practice until I can do it. Let me tell you, it does not work. You need your feeling of success. So um, divide your progress into very small steps. If you want to get better with your left hand, check where you are right now. Let's take for example the up and down stroke. You can play it at 60 beats per minute with your left hand. Then just say, I want to play it at 75 beats per minute 
until next week. That's a reachable, that's a realistic goal and a very small step. And then you increase the tempo the next week and then you have this feeling of success. Um, this is generally about the frustration and uh, that's a very big topic. Uh, a lot of my videos are on motivation in my workshops as well. So let, that's it for now on the frustration topic. Uh, let me get to the left hand. There are no real specific exercises for the weaker hand. Just do what you want to learn again. Practice what you want to be able to play and with your weaker hand, just practice it more. About twice as much. There is a very, a very interesting effect that it also trains your stronger hand, so it's no time wasted. Just take a little bit more time. Imagine you play the bass guitar. Usually a bass guitar player can play a little bit of guitar as well because you talk a lot with guitarists, you see a lot of guitarists, the instruments are related, but you would never expect, if you never practiced the guitar, to play the guitar as well as the bass guitar. Um, and it's just like that with the left hand. If you do everything every day with your strong hand uh, in your everyday life, 15, 16 hours a day, you cannot expect your left hand to learn as fast as your right hand. So start by doing more in your everyday life with your weaker hand in the kitchen, for example. Very good example, or just write, your, um, write a, uh, your shopping list with your weaker hand, for example. Just many small exercises to train the dexterity and your, your sense of touch with the left hand, which is just not as good as with your strong, stronger hand because you just use it more. And the same on the instrument, just start with lower standards and then make up the difference by just spending a little bit more time on the exercises and more on the basics, on the very uh, specific movements with your weaker hand. Will there be a DVD or a book by you? Well, the DVD is a little bit outdated, just the format. Um, I mean, just take a video series on my YouTube channel. That's the equivalent of a DVD. When we look at a specific topic for a series of videos, then you have the same as a DVD. Or my workshops, of course, where we look at a specific topic very uh, intensely for a day or two. And also we have this personal interaction. So this is um, um, my equivalent for teaching DVD. And about the book, yes, I guess I will definitely write a book or books. I'm just the person to do something like that. I like teaching, I like writing, so this is perfect for me. But I guess it won't be a pure drum teaching book, maybe something more meta, something like Effortless Mastery, just a brilliant book, something like that probably, but time will tell. Before a live performance, what do you eat and drink to perform your best? That's a very good question and it's actually really important. But it's more important when to eat and how much you eat. Generally, I like to eat as healthy and as sustainably as possible, so mostly plant-based, um, just to stay healthy and fit and can perform my best. And on the day of the show, everything I do um, it's just to the goal of playing the best show possible and of course this includes nutrition and if you uh, just deal with the topic a bit then you get a good feeling what works for you and what does not work for you so just try different things uh, for me what works good is to eat two hours minimum uh, before the show two to three hours is best then I have a, just a normal meal not too much and not too many carbs um, then a bit of rest, maybe a coffee, and then I uh, change. So I like to warm up in my um, in, in the clothes I wear on, wear on stage. I like to warm up thoroughly, maybe even up to two hours. Um, not, uh, not that I'm exhausted before the show, but I just like to... I like to practice and um, if I have the time I actually practice and this uh, before the show and this is my warm-up then I take some time uh, with my bandmates just you know get the vibe and ironically then I sometimes again need a snack but that does not make me um, tired just to keep the level and what I like to do is just eat something on stage if you have a two-hour rock show you need something on stage so I like to eat a banana on stage looks funny but for me it works and sometimes 
something that looks funny on stage also contributes to the show. And sometimes I even take some supplements, but um, that's the general thing. Try out what works for you. And if you find out what works for you, please let me know in the comments. But of course, on tour, you have not always the choice when to eat and what to eat, or if you can warm up and uh, if you have the two to three hours before the show. Um, yes, uh, what helps is just have um, a ration for the for the worst case if uh, if you're vegan and you only have schnitzel, uh, which sometimes happens, uh, then just have something in your bag. Uh, like I like to use Huel, the Huel um, powder, and just make a Huel shake, and then um, I have something I can scale myself, and I. Um, in, I am in charge myself when to eat and how much to eat. The most common question actually was, when will we see you play live on stage again and with whom? Uh, yeah, since I left uh, my band, um, I have not been playing in a band um, again, because of course at the moment playing live is very difficult. And um, yeah, so I left the band to be open for new endeavors, new projects, new styles of music, new styles of bands, actually. Yeah, I'm just open and flexible and I like to pl uh, be playing in the band again. But this will probably be with different bands and artists because actually my strong suit is to sub, to fill in for other drummers or to work project-based. So for a specific time, I put all my eggs, eggs in one basket and just focus on one project. I can learn very fast, so I'm, I'm able to learn a whole live set in a, in a few days. Um, and to yeah, meet the standards and not just play the songs, but actually to become a musician for this band, to become a real part of this band, this genre. That's what I like to do. So probably it will be different bands and projects. I don't know. Uh, if you're watching, you need a drummer, let me know. You can of course recommend me to bands who are looking for a drummer and I will be happy to play live again soon. I will let you know here on my homepage on social media, of course. Here's another common question. When will you give a workshop in my area? I mean, I like to give workshops. I love to give workshops, but um, there is someone or something that needs to be uh, the middleman between you who wants to come to a workshop and me who gives the workshop because we need a location, we need some, somebody to organize it to so you can register and we have a location and, and stuff like that. So if you know someone who can and wants to book me, let me know. Um, we just need someone with experience in booking and a good location. Of course, uh, fortunately, we don't need that much for my workshops, but we just need somebody who is the organizer. Maybe you yourself want to be the organizer, then just uh, contact me, I'll be happy to answer and maybe I will give a workshop in your area. And just to stay up to date, just check my homepage every few weeks, there you can find the current dates. Next question, how important are social media for artists today and how to get studio jobs um, with the oversaturation and the zeitgeist? Of course, social media is very important, but not as important as many think, because still, if you want to play live, if you want to have good contacts, a good uh, network, most things are about sympathies and connections. So get out there, go to parties, go to um, scene events, go to trade fairs and just uh, talk to people, get to know people, have good social skills and uh, this is your best bet. But of course you should cover the basics, so have a good Instagram profile, Facebook, YouTube, um, so people can find you and people see that you take your job seriously. Um, same with a business card. Business card is just so great because of course you don't actually need it, but it shows that you put effort into creating this little card. So I always have my, my business card with me and still today it's, uh, it's well received to just give somebody your card and uh, because it just shows that you care. Also, you should have some videos on YouTube uh, live and in the studio so people see that you can play well, but also make a good live show. 
Um, but of course, if you want to make a living on social media like I do on YouTube, um, then of course, it's much more important. You can make a whole career out of uh, drumming on Instagram, then this is your main field of endeavor and not just promotion. So if you want to get studio jobs, again, uh, it's mostly about connections, networking, sympathies. So just talk to people, offer your services, maybe play a few gigs uh, free of charge and get recommended, stuff like that. And of course, recording from home and sending the recordings uh, via internet is very simple today. They are different platforms where you can do that. But I like to actually go into the studio with a band or an artist because I like to be separated and have this location for this project. It's, uh, I like this intimate atmosphere of being together in the studio and working on the minutest details uh, to get the best out of a song. The last song you would like to listen before an asteroid hits the Earth. I actually don't like questions of this format because I'm not a fan of reductionism, because I don't have one favorite song and there is not one perfect snare drum, but there is one perfect snare drum for this song and there, um, there is one perfect movie for my mood today. So uh, my answer does not refer to my favorite song, but I would like to find the most appropriate song for this situation and this is uh, an epic situation. Just, you know, standing on the edge of the world and be destroyed by this huge asteroid. So I would like to pick a very grandiose and epic song. So here is a list of great songs for this um, opportunity. I see a lot of drummers who just play one style of music and are probably pretty good at that, uh, but only at that. I would like to know what you think. I like reggae, swing, jazz, Latin, blues, rock and funk, and I don't want to reduce it to just one style. Yes, of course, uh, the bigger one field is, the more it gets divided into different subcategories. And the drum set uh, is old enough that it's prevalent in many different styles and you can never play everything of course and you shouldn't it always depends on if you want to do it as a hobby or uh, as a job and how you want to do it as a job because um, if you can play many different styles and if you say hey can i can play a bit of that a bit of that i can play everything um, then you won't get any jobs because if if somebody's looking for a rock musician he will get a rock musician and not a drummer who plays a bit of rock. And if somebody's looking for a Latin drummer, he will get a Latin drummer and not somebody who plays a bit of Latin. But of course, uh, cover gigs or dance music, um, if you want to play that, then maybe it's the right way for you. And if you want to play it as a hobby and just enjoy it, please do what you like, of course. But just one disclaimer, um, if you, um, have this variety and play different styles all the time. This is very interesting and I, I know if you play rock for a few days then it just feels great to play some softer music every once in a while and vice versa. But this way you always stay on the surface and you want to immerse yourself in one topic and learn a lot about that for a given time and this can be exhausting and can be hard but this is how you learn the most. And if you are a jack of all trades, this won't get you that far because we need specialists. But you can do it like me. I like different styles of music too. Um, and I have made a conscious decision what not to play, even though I like it, because I differentiate between I like it and I want to play it. But I want to play different style of, styles of music. I like progressive music. I like jazz, I like metal. So I'm a specialist at this combination of progressive metal and jazz. This is a very specific genre, I know, but um, this makes it easier to be very good at this very specific topic. It includes different styles of music I like to learn about, um, but I don't try to cover everything. Would you cut your hair for a good cause? I just cut one meter of hair for the child cancer organization. 
Interesting question. Yes, I would definitely do so if you can convince me that my action would actually result in uh, good things happening. Because the problem with uh, things like that, which have this uh, signal character or signaling effect, um, like, like a role model effect, the problem is I feel good about myself and you feel good about this action and you give a like and leave a comment, but still nothing has happened. So I just like to donate myself and I promise you I will today donate 50 euro to this organization against um, child cancer and still keep my hair if you don't mind. And what I like to do also is I like to give donations as a present so this year for Christmas, again, I will donate money to an organization um, or a cause that I know this person cherishes and then donate in their name. And also I have a very interesting anecdote about this because there is a very um, yeah, detrimental effect about uh, things with, with signaling effect. I have seen a very, very popular German artist on a big stage and on his huge um, screen there were very horrific images of, um, yeah, of, of pollution and destroyed nature. And he was, uh, you know, ha uh, ranting about um, the politicians and people who destroy our future. And he was standing between um, the huge uh, pillars of the stage and he had pyrotechnics and guest musicians and a choir and probably travels around Germany with big trucks. And the problem is, as I said, you give a like, you leave a comment, but still nothing has happened. And even worse, you feel like you have done something. You feel like you have achieved something by giving a like or applauding this rant and then everybody was leaving getting into their cars and driving home so change starts with yourself what i wanted to say with this is he would have had much more impact by just canceling his tour because this would have had a big effect because there would be um, much less co2 in the atmosphere because he would not drive around with 10 trucks through germany and this would have a real signaling effect. Just cancelling the tour for nature. This would be a role model. So I don't like things with this uh, big uh, signaling effect. I like to do things. I don't have a car. I do everything by bike and with a train. I like to reduce. Uh, I like to recycle and reuse, of course. I, um, I, I watch closely uh, um, how my, my sponsors work, if they work sustainably. And I think this is much more important than just being a role model, but um, on, on the surface and not acting myself. So as I said, I promise you I will donate 50 euro today to the child um, cancer organization. Maybe you want to add something to that. Maybe you want to give uh, donations as a present this Christmas. But that would be great. Thank you all very much for your questions. I hope to see you in the next video next Thursday. Until then, take care and bye bye.